Well, welcome once again. Let's talk about politics and governance. And I'll start this episode with a question. Do we have a legal responsibility to people who aren't even born yet? And we address this question today with Svenja Berendt, my guest, who explores the challenges of creating laws for future generations. And what are, as we'll see, the several schools of thought about this. Svenja, welcome to our episode. Svenja, you argue in the article that there is a gap in legal scholarship concerning uh, obligations towards future generations. And this gap is important because it can lead to policies that, well, harm or don't harm future people, correct? Yes, um, I think it... It's not really about um, uh, a gap in scholarship that concerns itself with uh, legal obligations towards uh, future human human beings or future gen generations. There is a heaps of lit literature out there on this issue, but most of it is uh, from the discipline of uh, moral philosophy, or um, they argue that um, um, there are there is an interests of human beings um, to care for others and especially for the well-being of our offspring and i think that they are right in doing that and i think that also the um scholarship that is um that stems from the moral philosophy for example that there is there are good approaches there but i just think that you do not get the full-fledged uh, concept that accounts for the intertemporal dimension of human rights and therefore you also lack a profound conceptual basis for legal obligations towards future generations and that is the gap that i wanted to mm -hmm. fill with my project mm -hmm. perfect so tell us the highlights of your work um okay so uh, first of all, um, legal obligations towards uh, future generations and future gen uh, future right holders anchor in human rights. Um, so you do not need to uh, have a, a certain an additional um, anchor in human rights or in constitutional law that expressly states that there is an obligation towards future generations. It's, so it is completely sufficient uh, that there are um, human rights in your constitution. And then um, you have everything you need to argue that there is uh, an obligation towards uh, future generations, a legal obligation, not only a moral one. And um, there, there you go. So um, this is basically the, the main um, aspect that is needed um, to argue that point. Fundamental rights and uh, human rights are about uh, rights of that particular right holder. So once you have um, that right holder, um, and there are several right holders, uh, you get a sort of relationship between those right holders. Because every right holder can, can um, expect from the other right holder that their interests um, that are like contained in that right um, are respected so that you should omit an action that um, uh, sort of infringes on that interest uh, and that you take the action that supports that interest so you get uh, a relationship um, that um, asks uh, from um, every right holder um, to like take care of um, to respect the other one's interests. So it's sad, sort of an about the equality in rank there that is uh, fundamental to that concept. And I explain it in way more detail in my uh, PhD thesis as well. But that's the the core structure of it, that there is a relationship between right holders um, that is fundamental to uh, fundamental rights and human rights. And everything else uh, develops from there. And um, with this project on uh, intergener the intertemporal dimension of human rights, I sort of ask how these relationships uh, between right holders, how it develops over time. So how you can actually conceive um, um, or make sense of the, the, the issue that uh, people die new people are born and that it's sort of a continuous line of uh, members of those uh, relationships. And uh, what the, resu the result of this uh, sort of concept is that you get a 
um, a full-fledged account of the intertemporal dimension of human rights, and it's a relational one. It's not a, a static one like uh, what the German Federal Constitutional Court states, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned um, moral obligations anchored in human rights and this relationship between right holders and how it develops over time. And you actually mention um, in the article different interests of these right holders mm -hmm. and how those you know, might change over time. So um, these moral obligations and this relationship between right holders in practical terms, what can happen? What's the consequences policy-wise? Um, may I just uh, sort of, it's not really about moral obligations in um, human rights mm -hmm. because moral obligations and legal obligations can be like completely different um different from one another um with how you argue uh, moral obligations is a completely different set of structure they're completely uh, different um things to consider when you are arguing with within the field of um, morality or moral philosophy philosophy than if you are arguing about it as a positivist legal scholar and that is uh, also one issue that i'm trying to show with this paper that it's not um, about taking a moral argument and like putting it into human rights, you can get to those obligations uh, towards future generations and future right holders on a positivist understanding of, of the law. You just have that those anchors in the constitutional law, the, the norm text that give you um, fundamental rights and human rights and everything else develops from there. there it is not about moral obligations. So even though there there is there are similarities to the discussion in moral philosophy, but it is about um, saying and showing that there is a legal foundation there that it is a legal concept, positivist legal concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's ahead of us to study now? Um, what's ahead of us? Um, there are. First of all, I think it it. Um, it follows that we have a presentist bias in politics, in the decisions of uh, right holders um, that is actually studied by others and people have uh, shown that it exists. And I think that um, my research shows that there is a constitutional argument, a human rights argument, that we need to address those this presentist bias, biases um, in decision makers, in decision making processes. And I think that there is um, uh, a really interesting um, interdisciplinary work to be done there. Um, mm -hmm. for, for example, it could be really interesting to see how we can address how we um, go about it uh, to address this um, um, uh, presentist bias. Uh, for example, um, there is a, a project here that at the Institute, at the Max Planck Institute I work at, uh, that I find particularly interesting with that regard. It's called uh, Future You. It's, um, and it's about um, confronting people with um, their future selves um, and I think that there might be something there to um, to show um, to make people more um, to to make people engage with their future selves. I think mm -hmm. that could also be something really interesting for um, this project of mine uh, and those issues there regarding the presentist bias. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of other issues I could state, but that's that's one example. <laughs> Sure. So at least we have some topics for uh, for future research, because unfortunately, uh, we cannot address all of the new questions that this article brings up. But I'm curious to know your personal thoughts on the topic. So what struck you the most? What's your most uh, important reflection of this? Um, when I started to work on the project, I wasn't sure whether it would work out like that that's that's not how how you you um go about your research i mean you got an, a thesis thesis you got maybe a gut feeling that there could be something there and you're sort of determined to drill down on it and um what what struck me the most was um i could 
start to see clearly how um, the normative layer and the epistemic issues that always sort of go along with uh, those topics, um, that they really can be separated and that there is a huge value in separating those issues from one another. And um, it's I was surprised to see how it actually um, lines up. It's it's completely in line with uh, other issues um, um, in legal theory that I uh, find um, think that yeah that they are true that we should separate those from one another and how yeah it sort of all <laughs> works out <laughs> mm -hmm. in some way you know that that's something that yeah really uh, yeah made that's me great. yeah well, was great it was a great feeling to see that that's great uh, I'm gonna make this a little bit more challenging for you uh, a little bit more uh, because I know that there's a lot to discuss here but if you were to sum up this conversation in no more than two sentences so the punchline what would it be it would be that First of all, legal obligations towards future right holders anchor in human rights in a much more profound way than the European Court of Human Rights and the German Federal Cons Constitutional Court state. And um, the way we currently address future interests is distorted and uncertainty does not mean that there is no obligation mm -hmm. and or that we that we could not be at fault for for doing um, for having a present bias. So great ending. Uh, Svenja, thank you very much. Thank you, Rodrigo. <laughs> so for those who are uh, watching on YouTube, you can find all the resources, all the materials that I just chatted with Svenja uh, in the Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website, including the article that served uh, as base for this conversation. Uh, this conversation is also available on uh, podcast platforms. Uh, you can subscribe our newsletter and follow us on Twitter.